Good morning, everyone. Uh, if you're a guest here with us this morning, my name is Brandon. I'm one of the pastors here. We want to welcome you here with us this morning. I do have a few announcements for us before we begin our worship. On Wednesday night at 630, uh, we're going to have a representative from a ministry called Love Life. Uh, she's going to come here, and it's going to be basically an information meeting where we can learn uh, how our church can become more involved in this ministry. It's a pro-life ministry, and we have had um, a little bit of association with them already, but we're going to learn about some new ways that our church can get involved in partnering with this ministry. So uh, I really want to encourage everyone to come out for that. Um, that's going to be at 630 uh, this Wednesday evening. Also, this afternoon at 5 p.m., uh, we're going to have our monthly prayer service. We'll meet here in the sanctuary. This is a time every month that's set apart where we pray specifically for revival, uh, that God would awaken um, our church and would awaken our city, our state, and our nation. Uh, so please gather with us today at 5 p.m. And finally, uh, immediately after this service for our members, we'll, we, we will be having a uh, business meeting. So please do stick around for that. We have a couple of very important items um, of business on the agenda that we will cover, and that's going to start as soon as this service uh, is over. We're going to uh, begin our worship this morning with a reading from God's Word. If you will, please stand with me. We are going to read aloud together uh, from the book of Proverbs this morning. Proverbs chapter 8, we're going to read verses 1 through 8 aloud together. Does not wisdom cry out, and understanding lift up her voice? She takes her stand on the top of the high hill, beside the way where the paths meet. She cries out by the gates, at the entry of the city, at the entrance of the doors. To you, O men, I call, and my voice is to the sons of men. O you simple ones, understand prudence, and you fools, be of an understanding heart. Listen, for I will speak of excellent things, and from the opening of my lips will come right things. For my mouth will speak truth. Wickedness is an abomination to my lips. All the words of my mouth are with righteousness. Nothing crooked or perverse is in them. Let's go to the Lord in prayer together. God, we know from reading your word that you are always and forever worshipped uh, by the angelic hosts who surround your throne. They always have and they always will. But Lord, as we are the church, we are called out of the world. And, and each and every week we gather here together uh, to join in that worship. Lord, that is our purpose for being here today, uh, is to exalt your name, to praise you. To praise you that we are a forgiven people. Lord, we are thankful for that truth that we can rest in the forgiveness that is ours in Christ this morning. But Lord, we also want to be a wise people. We want to be a people of truth. We want to be a people of righteousness, just as we have read about here in the book of Proverbs. So Lord, we ask that you would fill us with your spirit. That your spirit would help us to follow the way of our Savior. And we pray this in his name. Amen. Praise and throne. 
believe you gave sight to the blind. I believe that the dead came to life. I believe there were wonders and signs, and you're still the same. I believe every word that you said. I believe there are scars in your hands, that your goodness is good without end, and you'll never change. I will tell of your wonders, sing of your grace. The God of creation knows me by name. The Lord is faithful yesterday, now, and always, always. Because your mercy is mighty age after age. And all generations will bow down and praise the Lord is faithful yesterday, now, and always, always. I believe you will come in the clouds. I believe you are here even now. In your presence I know there is power, power to save. God of creation knows me by name. The Lord is faithful yesterday, now, and always, always. Your mercy is mighty, age after age, and all generations will bow down and praise. The Lord is faithful yesterday, now, and always, always. always will be God. You are, you are, you are, you are, you always will be God. Yes, you always will be God. I will tell of your wonders, sing of your grace. The God of creation knows me by name. The Lord is faithful. some praise this morning and you may be seated
Well, good morning, church. If you would, go ahead and take your copy of God's Holy Word and turn me to 1 Timothy chapter 5. We're going to pick up while we left off last week in verse 17. If you just join us, we're going verse by verse through the book of Timothy. And, and ne next time I'm preaching Timothy, hopefully we will finish this sermon series. 1 Timothy chapter 5, and we're going to start reading in verse 17. And if you're able, let's stand for the reading of God's Holy Word. Let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture says, You shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain, and the labor is worthy of his wages. Do not receive an accusation against an elder except uh, from two or three witnesses, those who are sinning rebuke them in the presence of all, that the rest also may fear. I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that you observe these things without prejudice, doing nothing with partiality. Do not lay hands on anyone hastily, nor share in other people's sins. Keep yourself pure. No longer drink only water, but use a little wine for your stomach's sake as your frequent infirmities. Some man's sins are clearly evident, preceding them to judgment, but those are some men who follow later. Likewise, the good works of some men are clearly evident, and those that are otherwise cannot be hidden. Will you pray with me, church? Father God, we just thank you so much that we're able to freely gather here on Sunday morning to worship you. Um, God, it is my prayer that you would continue just to speak to us uh, through the reading of your word. Uh, so Lord, I just ask that you bless our time spent as a church family studying this text today. Speak, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And you may be seated. During his life on earth, our Lord Jesus Christ, he founded only one organization, and that's his church. That is also the only institution that the Lord Jesus Christ promised to bless. The, the church was designed and chosen by the Father in eternity past. It was redeemed by the work of the Son on the cross, and it was begotten by the power of of the Holy Spirit. The church is now the chosen channel through which God's saving truth flows to a lost world. The family of God, the church is to maintain purity and power that can penetrate the kingdom of darkness with the glorious light of the gospel. By so, by so doing, it will rescue men and women from Satan's control and it would draw them to the light of the kingdom. The church is the body of Christ. It's the visible form of Christ in the world. Its purpose is to reveal his glory and draw people to him. The church is also to model godly virtue in an ungodly world by living according to God's instruction. I think Peter summed it up well when he wrote 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into the marvelous light. The church's ability to fulfill its mission, the church's ability to, to have the anointing and the power uh, to be the church that God called it to be, it starts with the top. It starts with its pastors and its leaders and its deacons. The Ephesian church in Timothy's day, they could trace back most of the troubles to ineffective leadership. In this passage, Paul teaches Timothy, the Ephesians, and us how to restore truly biblical leadership. The, the instruction that, that he gives this church, it falls into three categories. 
how ministers should be paid, how ministers should be disciplined, and ordination. In other words, uh, how men should be called into the ministry in the first place. Do they meet the requirements that he gives us in 1 Timothy chapter 3? And if they don't, do not lay hands on them and call them to be leaders of God's house. Now, you may be thinking, Pastor, church government don't really seem like uh, an exciting text for us to study today. But I want you to consider what happens when these instructions are ignored. If ministers are not adequately paid and they got to worry about how they're going to pay their bills, it's a distraction. What happens if a pastor is falsely accused, then their teaching will be dismissed. And if they're not disciplined, the church will lack respectability, especially if these men never should have been allowed to be uh, elder or a pastor in the church in the first place. In short, if a church fails to practice these biblical instructions, it's a church that's going to lose its anointing. It's a church that's going to lose its power, and it's a church that is bound to fail in the ministry. So let's jump into verse 17 of our text this morning, of chapter 5. It says, Let elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. If you remember from last week, Paul just got finished telling the church that they are to financially support widows who are truly widows. Uh, if they are truly a widow, this is, this is something that the church should do. Now he moves to another member of the church that makes up the family of God, and that is the church elder or pastor. That word elder is interchangeable if you want to use the word bishop or pastor. And he now tells them that, that the church, you're responsible to pay your leaders, to pay your pastors. And this is not a topic that I care to speak on because uh, I'm your pastor. <laughs> But this is why I go verse by verse through Scripture. Uh, I can't skip it or, or overlook it. Now, one wish be says, <clears throat> if pastors meets the requirements of ruling well, who works hard at the ministry of the word and doctrine, if the pastor is faithful in feeding and leading the people, then the church ought to be faithful in paying him adequately. He said that's what the word double honor means. It, that can be translated to generous pay. Uh, that, that, that word honor, uh, that word comes from honorarium. He went on to say, it is God's plan that the needs of his servants be met by the local church. And God will bless the churches that are faithful to his chosen servants. If a church is not faithful and if a pastor's needs are not met, it's a poor testimony. And God has his ways of dealing with the situation. He can provide through other means, but then the church misses the blessings, or God can move his servant elsewhere. The SBC, that's the Southern Baptist Convention, uh, I read an article, and they interviewed many of the pastors that make up the SBC. And, and the question was, what is the number one stressor in your ministry? And by far, the most common answer was financial stress. Worried about retirement, how we're going to pay for college. Christianity Today uh, wrote an article, and it says there is so many articles out there like this. And, of course, you can see the other end how pastors are taking people's money, but, but most of the time it's, it's like this. Christianity Today told a story of a pastor named Steve from Montana with a wife and three children. Pastor Steve tried to make ends meet somewhere below the poverty line, and for a while, his family managed to scrape by, but eventually the debts began to accumulate. Eventually, Pastor Steve went to the church deacons to ask for a raise, and the deacons, they grudgingly agreed to give him a small raise, but it was not large enough to meet his family monthly expenses. The deacons recommended that Steve apply for assistance from the Montana Power Company to help pay his utility bills. And they also told him if he needed more money, he ought to become a chaplain with the National Guard. It's only one weekend a month. The irony of this was the income of the church was far exceeding its expenses, and there was plenty of money in the bank to spare. Not surprisingly, Pastor Steve almost completely left the ministry altogether 
He said he considered looking for a secular job that would pay enough to take care of his family and also enough to settle his debt he's required as being a pastor of that church. He was a good man. He was not looking to leave an extravagant life. He was willing to endure hardship in the ministry, but his own church led him to the temptation by failing to meet his daily needs. Then the article, it, it went on to say, when a church refuses to pay its minister a decent wage and benefits, it is disobedience to the will of God. And then it quotes the next verse in our text, verse 18. For the scripture says, You shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain, and the labor is worthy of his wages. So back in biblical days, there was a threshing floor. And usually uh, when they would bring the sheaves of wheat, they would lay it in a circle on this threshing floor, and it would be a pole right there in the middle. And to that pole would be a tether that attached to two ox. And they would drive those ox around in a circle and around in a circle, and it would, it would thrash, it would step on the wheat, it would separate the, the, the shade from the kernels. And, and what the, the Old Testament law says is when you're working that animal like that, you don't put a muzzle on his mouth. And that muzzle would have kept him from eating. He's saying that animal is working for you. You let him eat any of that wheat he wants to while he's on that thrashing floor walking around. That's why it says don't put a muzzle when he treads out the grain. He was free to eat the grain as a reward of the work that he was doing. And, and Paul cites this directly from Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 4. He reasons that if God in his law expressed concern for hard-working animals to be fed and to be properly taken care of, church members ought to show proper consideration for their pastors, supplying them with a decent wage. In other words, Paul is saying it is good to feed your cow, but it is better to feed your pastor. All right, I'm moving on from that. That, that was the text beforehand, and that, that, I'm going to preach that like I do any other text. Let's move down to verse 19 through 22. Do not receive an accusation against an elder except for two or three witnesses. Those who have sinned, you rebuke them in the presence of all, that the rest also may fear. I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels. That, that, that word angel is lowercase. That just simply means the messengers, the other leaders in the church, that you observe these things without prejudice and doing nothing with partiality. Do not lay hands on anyone hastily nor share in other people's sins. And Timothy, keep yourself pure if you're going to be the leader of that church. We need to remember that in our text, there was a lot of issues going on in this church. You remember in chapter 1, Paul called the church a shipwreck. Some of the elders in Ephesus, they had fallen into false teaching and ungodly conduct, and which always usually goes hand in hand with false doctrine. So Paul gives two crucial safeguards to help Timothy as the young leader of this church and help the church leadership help it to stay godly. First, the proper exercise of church discipline towards sinning elders, and second, the careful selection of elders. He is saying that to keep church leadership godly, pastors must be disciplined properly and selected carefully. We already know that, that some of the uh, elders in Ephesus have already been dismissed. Uh, from their job, from false teaching, from reading this text. Some are already falling away. And perhaps we have this in the Word of God because there's other accusations uh, and rumors that were circulating about the other elders that were part of that church. So Paul deals first with the proper process of discipline before going on to talk about preventive steps and selection of the church leaders so that the church will only put godly men into office. These verses reveal three aspects of proper discipline of church leaders. First, there needs to be factual evidence. Second, the need for public rebuke. And third, the need for impartiality. An elder, uh, a pastor, must be disciplined on the basis of factual as evidence. Not hearsay, not gossip, not rumors. Paul specifically applies it to church leaders here because 
but they are more liable to false accusations and slander than, er, than other people, especially men who will stand up and preach God's truth. False accusations are one of the most dangerous weapons. If you don't think it can happen to a godly man, you ought to uh, read Genesis and read about Joseph. You ought to read Moses and about David and Jeremiah and Nehemiah. And look what false accusations did to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. They all suffered from false accusations. Remember, Satan is always trying to discredit the authority of God's word. And one of the methods he often uses is to attack the credibility of the man who is teaching the word. If people doubt his integrity, they can easily shrug off what he is trying to teach them through the word of God. So Satan often stirs up people who have been offended by the preaching of God's truth or who are upset because a church leader had to confront them privately about their sin. They spread half-truths uh, or outright lies to discredit the man and his message. It's important to the testimony of Christ that we handle such situations, though, in a godly way. If a person is is spreading rumors or gossip, he needs to be corrected. If it's a legitimate issue, it needs to be processed according to God's word. So what do you do if someone comes to you about me, uh, about a sin and, or, or, or something? What do you do if someone comes to Brandon? What do you do if someone comes to you about Garrett, about something going on? Because we are the leaders of this church. Uh, I think Bill Goddard gives us some good questions that we need to ask and decide what we do next. One, where did you get the information? Is there more than one independent witness? Have you talked directly to Pastor Will or Garrett or Brandon? Have you personally checked out all the facts? And if I address this situation, can I quote you? They're good questions to ask. So again, the first need in discipline a, a elder is to get correct information. If the charges are true, then that's the second need. Proper discipline of a church leader is required. The uh, proper translation here is those who are sinning, meaning those guilty of the charges who do not repent. Sinning means some very clear violation of God's word, not just something that someone doesn't like or something that you don't agree with. If it's a public sin, such as false teaching, or a sin that is in public view, then public rebuke may be called as the first step. But normally, the, the, the steps is first a private rebuke that uh, need to be followed before any public rebuke is made public to the church. The goal is never to blast uh, a leader, but to restore him. And if he repents after a private rebuke, it may be necessary for a public confession to the church. And depending on the seriousness of the sin, uh, the pastor may need to step down or the church may need to remove him from leadership. Also, uh, there's a need in, in selecting elders. Um, that, that's caution that needs to take place. We already know that some of the elders have failed into sin. And, and, and so they've been dismissed. Timothy is a young pastor who, who's been called to, to get this church back on track. And if the church won't be careful, uh, they may appoint people who are not qualified. Or they may appoint someone to this position too fast. Uh, and, and because they were not well qualified, they fell into sin. And it said that Tim Timothy would be a part of that sin. So before a church lay, lays hands on or puts a man in leadership, Paul is saying, make sure that these men meet these basic requirements. If they don't make these basic requirements, you need to question whether or not you need to ordain them and call them to be a leader. And let's just read them. It's in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1-7. This is a faithful saying. If the man desires the position of a, bis a bishop, a pastor, or an elder in the church, he does desire good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, nor violent, nor greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous, 
one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. If a man does not know how to rule his own house, how can he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. Moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. And, and these are the qualifications that, that your pastors definitely should have and display in their life. Also, uh, deacons. We're, we're nominating deacons at the business meeting. The only difference is uh, a deacon doesn't have to be able to teach like an elder has to be able to teach, but they have the same requirements. And church, I want to tell you, um, we had on nominees, we had over, we had 18 men nominated for deacons. And when I looked at that list, I had been proud to serve this church and this community with any of those men. That, that is pretty amazing testimony to the men in this church. And then he, he says, Timothy, you got to stay on top of this. this. This is something that you don't take lightly on making sure your leadership are the role models for the church. Because he says in verse 21, I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that you observe these things without prejudice, doing nothing with partiality. Paul wants to get Timothy's full attention, and he wants to emphasize this is a weighty task. This is an important matter at hand. The weighty task is hearing accusations against the pastors and rebuking them if necessary. He is saying never let someone's rank and leadership uh, cause them to be exempt. You, you cannot sweep that sin under the rug. It has to be dealt with. Timothy would have uh, a personal relationship with these men that he served with. They would be his friends. Uh, the church, they, they would know and love their pastors. Even, even if it's me, there's a clear charge to you. If I step out of line, if I'm not being the husband that God has called me to be, if I, if I got some sin in my life, it's y'all's responsibility to address it with me. It's my responsibility, Brandon's responsibility, and Garrett's responsibility to address one another and help keep each other in line also. No matter how painful it can be. Timothy was also not to show prejudice or favoritism. No one, uh, Paul is saying, is to receive preferential treatment. The rebuke of a sinning elder must be done with accuracy and integrity integrity there must be no effort to protect those who who are gifted speakers it doesn't make a difference if you're the president of the southern baptist convention you don't let sin in a leader's life go undressed i mean if you if you look at the news over the last two years you see all kind of nominations and cover-ups with their leaders because they don't want their reputation to be damaged it doesn't make a difference if it's me it has to be addressed if this church is going to be all that God wants to be. To rebuke sinning leaders, it's not easy for any church, yet God requires it because of the holiness in the church. It has to be protected and upheld. The question facing any church is whether well, is it more concerned about its reputation or God's holiness. And Paul is also saying, Timothy, I, I want you to understand who else these words are for. Timothy was Paul's son in the faith. I can't think of anybody that Paul probably loved more than Timothy. He said, these words are also for you. Then in verse 23 of 1 Timothy chapter 5, No longer drink only water, but use a little wine for your stomach's sake and your frequent infirmities. So in verse 22, Paul just told Timothy, you have to, as a leader, keep yourself pure. The precept, keep yourself pure, was a personal nature. This leads to another remark, which is also personal. No longer drink water only, 
but use a little wine for the sake of your stomach and your frequent elements. Paul is speaking of wine as a medicine here, not as a beverage. It was apparently that that, that was the best known remedy at the time for Timmy's troubles. The, the word implies that, that Timothy was a total abstainer from wine. Perhaps the reason was by his example, he sought to deter others from the use of this enslaving and destructive drink. And, and people, this, this is a, a debate that I get into all the time. People come to me all the time and, and say, Pastor, if, if I've been cutting my grass, is anything wrong after I get finished on a hot day if I just have a beer? Or, Pastor, what if uh, I just have a glass of wine to go with with my meal. Do, do I have the religious liberty in Christ to do that? And, and, and I can't say if you have just a drink. I can't, I can't point to scripture and, and say not to do that. But I can tell you that anything that you buy from the ABC store is considered a strong drink. And scripture absolutely 100% condemns the use of any strong drink to your lips. Matter of fact, in biblical days, the reason that Timothy was having a problem, the water was unsafe, so a lot of times they would cut the water with wine, and that would kill any of the bacteria or anything in the water to, to make it safe to drink. Um, drinking alcohol is, uh, it, what I want to say is drunkenness. It's clearly a sin in Scripture. There's no way to, to get around that. And being a slave to alcohol is clearly sinful. And drinking any alcohol is dangerous because it can lead to addiction. No one plans to become an alcoholic. It sneaks up on you and it ensnares you. And we live in a culture where so many are enslaved to alcohol, we need to be extremely careful uh, and that we don't cause another brother or sister in Christ to stumble. I believe if a believer has a problem with alcohol, and he sees Pastor Will drinking a glass of wine, and it leads him back to enslavement, I have sinned against my brother. Uh, for that reason, uh, I'm a teetotaler. I do not drink. I will never put a drop of alcohol to my lips because I want to be a pastor that always is above reproach. I ask the deacons and the other leaders of this church that you remain above reproach and do not partake in any alcohol. And, and I want to tell you, a long time before I, I studied the text, a long time before God called me to be a Sunday school teacher, a deacon, Baptist men's president, a long time before he called me to be a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, he clearly convicted me that that, that could not be a part of my life if I wanted to live and build his kingdom and use my life and be used by him. And so another thing I would tell you, if, if you had to come to me and ask me, is, a, is it a sin whether or not you, you, you drink? That, that should already be an indication that the Holy Spirit is already speaking to you about that matter. And also, uh, another side note, Paul didn't say, Timothy, claim your healing by faith. Speak healing into existence. He recommended medical use of wine to take care of what was going on uh, in his stomach. Now, if you're telling me that the only reason you drank uh, alcohol was because you need good medicine, I want to tell you Walmart has a lot better medicine on the shelves that you can buy uh, than, than, than what, what they were using at this text known at the time. So I would recommend going to Walmart and getting some Pepto-Bismol or something. <laughs> Timothy needed to take care of his body, good nutrition, proper rest and exercise, and using medicine when needed, that's not opposed to being a man of faith, uh, but rather part of being a good steward of our bodies and into God. I want to tell you, if I'm sick, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have people praying for me. You can anoint me with oil if you want to, but we're going to pray that God's going to heal me, and also I'm going to listen to my doctor. <laughs> We got a lot of great advances in modern medicine, and, and I, I'm going to have faith in medicine and, and pray that whether it's through a touch of God or through a, uh, the medicine healing me, uh, I'm going to still give God the glory uh, for whatever happens. Then in verse 24 and 25, you know, they, when they're talking about elders and uh, who you should select and shouldn't select as elders, and he said that, Timothy, some men's sin are clearly evident preceding them into judgment, but there are some men who's pretty much that sin, it takes a while for it to come out. 
Likewise, there are some men that from very early on, you, you can see how they love the Lord and the things that they do and how they would be excellent servants in God's house. And then those that otherwise, uh, they, they do things more behind the scenes. It might be as well known, but he said that, that won't be hidden forever, neither. One commentary said, some people are such blatant, blatant sinners that they can be ruled out for leadership from the outset. He said that Timothy would be able to spot them right away. And if you know right away they don't meet the qualifications, it, it, you, you move on. He said, but sometimes sin will take a while to surface. But one thing I have found out, sin will always be exposed. Sin will always eventually come to the light. Churches that have too quickly overlooked possibility of wrongdoing and leaders who appeared so acceptable have to endure the shocking and shaming humiliation when extramarital relations take place in the church or when there is physical or verbal wife and child abuse or when the church finds out that's been gross mismanagement of funds have been uncovered. Paul told Timothy that good deeds also will eventually be known as well. Even when we try to do good deeds secretly, people eventually find out, sometimes very soon, sometimes it's not until a person's death that his kindness and generosity are revealed. And I couldn't help but to think about 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 8 and 11. It says, We are confident, well pleased, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. I, I can't think of anything that is more comforting to anyone that is grieving the loss of a loved one than this precious promise that we have in Scripture right here. To be absent from the body, if you're a child of God, is to immediately be present with the Lord. That, there are some people who, who would say, well, Pastor, I think the soul goes into a sleep, and only when Jesus Christ comes back will, will we receive and be awakened. Well, and that, that text in Thessalonians says that when Jesus comes back for his bride, when Jesus comes back for his church, he's bringing those that are with him. Now, I'm not the smartest guy in the world, but to be with him, you have to be what? With him. So to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, and those are the ones that are with him that when he comes back for the bride are going to be coming with him. But because of that, to know that one day when we take our last breath, we're going to stand before a holy God. The next verse says, therefore, we should all make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well pleasing to him. If your theology is, you know what? I'm, I'm still at a certain age. I got a few more years. I can cut it up. And then when I get close to that time that I may take my last breath, I'm going to start getting it straight then. That's really bad theology. You, ain't got, you got to question whether or not that you have what I have. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he or she has done whether good or bad. Knowing, therefore, the, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Listen to this. But we are well known to God. Every one of us. Whether you're the pastor, whether you're saved, unsaved, everything that you do is well known to God. And I also trust are well known in your conscience. What, what, what a humbling thought. Everything we've done, whether good or bad, will be announced before the throne of the Lord of the universe. I, I can have everybody in here completely fooled. But one person I can never fool is the Lord God. You, you could be a deacon. You could be a Sunday school teacher. You, you could come, you could be a church mama and, and come to church and put on this show, but you're really plastic and fake. You might get by with it with us. But it would never get by the eyes of God. You will stand accountable one day. 
doesn't make a difference if you're saved or not saved. Every person is well known to God. Will you pray with me? Father God, we, um, in just a moment, as a congregation, as a church family, as part of the family of God, we're going to stand and stand to our feet to worship you, to praise your holy name. But God, also, I just pray that this will be a time that we reflect, that we think about your word. And Lord, I'm very thankful that you have called the leaders of your church to a high standard. And God, if me or Brandon or Garrett are not meeting that standard, God, I pray that you would bring conviction. God, I pray that if we're not a good, we're not setting a good standard with our co-workers or at school as regular believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. If their sin has not been dealt with, God, I just pray that we would get that right this morning. Lord, I pray that if there's someone here today who does not know you, who, are, who is walking and living that life in darkness, but praise God through the conviction of the Holy Spirit, they understand their real need for forgiveness. Now God, I just pray that right now, that you just overpower that person, that they have surrendered their will and their life to you, that they will confess you as Lord. God, I'm asking that you would save that person in a supernatural way, that right now, this day can be the day of salvation, that they give their heart and life, they ask for forgiveness, and do everything that they can do to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the instructions, the guidance that you give any church. And Lord, help us all, whether we're a pastor, whether we've just been saved, or whether we've been saved for 30 years. God, give us all that desire to live for you, to pursue purity in a real way. Lord, we love you, and it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Stand. Your home. 
shadow of death. I will fear no evil. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are on my side. Oh, two announcements. One, if you're a church member, don't forget to stay behind for uh, the business meeting. And also, just another reminder, on September 10th, uh, that Sunday evening at Count Carl Lake, uh, we're going to have a baptismal service. I, I think we have like, I think around 10 people that are, are going to participate in Believer's Baptism. And the reason I'm bringing that up, uh, there's someone here who's been saved and uh, has never been uh, uh, baptized, who maybe been disobedient to that first command that the God has gave us to declare what God has done through us, through our public testimony of the death, burial, and resurrection that, that, that we go through believers' baptism. Just talk to me, and uh, we, we, will, we will talk about it. So anyhow, let me dismiss us in prayer. Uh, Lord, we just uh, thank you for the gathering today. Uh, Lord, I'm very thankful for my church family. Uh, they have been good to me, and my family, and I'm uh, very thankful for that, and God, as uh, we depart and go to different ways, uh, help our actions, our words, what we do, be a testimony on truly what we believe. It's in Jesus' name, amen.